Verse 20, And Elisha died, and they buried him, and the, and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying, uh, burying a man, that, that, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. He just touched it. Mark chapter number five. Verse 21, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, and she not might but that she may be healed and she shall live and Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse and when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway or immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power had gone out of him turned, him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Let me direct your attention back up to the 20, to the 24th verse. It begins the story of Jesus coming back over he had started on this side of the sea and he originally had gone back at the beginning of the chapter he had gone over to the other side to the, the side of the Gadarenes and there when he had landed on the shore of the Gadarenes your Bible says that he was met by a man who had been living amongst in the tombs he was a man that had been possessed by thousands of devils He had enough devils to fill 2,000 swine. Just a side note, if one individual, one human soul has the capacity to hold 2,000 demon spirits, one spirit, one demon spirit is enough to wreck your life. One demon spirit is a supernatural being. But if, an, if a human soul has the vastness or the capacity to house 2,000 of these things. How much Holy Ghost could you hold? Think about that. Just one of those things is a supernatural being. Yet one man had enough, was depraved enough, had lost his mind enough 
that he had contained. He said, we are legion for we are many. Now some scholars and theologians argue about how many a legion was. Some say it was as little as 800 and some say as much as 2,000. It don't really matter to me whether it's 800 or 2,000. 800 still a lot of demons. And if a human soul can hold 800 or 2,000, how much of God could somebody that was completely yielded to him actually hold? That's the reason that we have Peter's shadow in Acts chapter 5, healing the sick. That's the reason that we have Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons in Acts chapter number 19. That's the reason that we had an anointing on a man like Elijah to a degree that even when he was thrown into the tomb, years later he had already decayed and just his bones were left that it had enough anointing left inside him that when a dead man was accidentally, not even on purpose, was accidentally thrown down into that sepulcher because the enemy invaders had come and they were afraid they said we've got to speed up this funeral let's just throw him in here and hightail it across the field they just dumped him off down in there didn't even realize what they were doing and threw him down on the inside and there he fell down and happened to come in contact incidentally with the anointing and it had enough power to raise him up from the dead There is power in the anointing of God. It is the anointing of God that makes demons nervous. That's why the devil fights that so very much. That's why he'll let you come to church. He'll let you sing a few cute songs. He'll let you just read a short scripture or there. But the minute you want to press into God and actually get filled with the Holy Ghost and realize that the power of God has more to it than to just raise the hair on your arms. Well, he wants to fill you and make you a conduit of his power. I have a Bible and it still says that these signs would follow them that believe in my name they would lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover something supernatural happens when they come in contact with the power of God and so this text begins Jesus had started out on this side and had gone over to Gadara. He had gone over with only one mission in mind. He delivered the man in the tombs. Sets him free, gets back on the boat and goes back to the other side. Understand this, Jesus will make a detour just for you. He came over there only for him. Jesus invaded enemy held territory. In fact, Gadara was an area that had been inhabited by demonic power. It was, an, it was an area that no self-respecting Jew of Jesus' day would normally go. It was an area that in your Bible maps is called the area of Decapolis. It was an area that had been under Greek rule and then Roman rule and they had an amalgamation of Greek and Roman gods. That's what they had worshipped over there. It was an area of complete depravity. Jesus had gone over there by boat the last few verses of the fourth, cha fourth chapter of Mark tell us of a storm that had arisen while he was coming across the Sea of Galilee. That storm was so great that it had almost sank the ship they were in and the disciples, Jesus goes to sleep in the middle of the storm. You ever felt like God was sleeping during your storm? He goes to sleep. In the middle of the storm. Now, I'm not talking about a storm out in the middle of the Shenandoah River or the Potomac River. I'm talking about the Sea of Galilee. If you've never been to Israel, it's quite a large sea. I'm talking about a major sea or a major lake. If you've ever been out on the Great Lakes in the middle of a storm, it's no different almost than being out in the ocean during a storm. I'm talking about swells 20 and 30 and in some cases 40 feet high. These are swells that are higher than the boat. They, for all intents and purposes, thought they were about to go down. And they shake him. And they say, Master, wake up. Don't you care? Don't you care? We're all about to die and you're taking a nap. And he, do, he doesn't get up. That's all right, Peter. You know. He gets up and rebukes him for his faithlessness. He rebukes him for his worry. 
he rebukes him for his fear and says, oh, ye of little faith, Jesus stands up, wipes the sleep out of his eye and rebukes it and says, peace be still. And he lays back down. Maybe he goes back to sleep. Then they land on the shore. And then your Bible says in the first couple of verses of chapter five, the man in the tombs met him there. He met him there. In other words, he was waiting on Jesus. Why was he waiting on Jesus? Because he was the one that sent the storm. The enemy sent the storm to try to keep the anointing from getting to that area. Understand this, demon power is attached to regions. That's why when he cast the devil out of the man, this is all free, I didn't even put this in my sermon. But when he cast out the devil in Gadara, what did that demon say? He said, allow us to stay in the region." The Greek word is actually the word region. I think it's translated in some of your translations as actually coast. But in the Greek, it actually is the word that means region. They wanted to stay in that region. Why did they want to stay in the region? Because it was an area they had great attachment to. It was an area they had had a principality over. It was an area that they had dominion over. It was an area that had not had the light of the gospel. It was an area that was devoted over to demon power. They were comfortable there. They wanted to stay there. And all of a sudden, they heard Jesus on the other side when he said, let's go over to the other side and those principalities heard those words spoken by the son of God and they got a little nervous and they said hold on a minute Jesus has been in Capernaum he's been in Nazareth he's been in Bethlehem he's even been in Jerusalem I just heard in the spirit realm him say he was coming over here we've got to stop him so they sent the storm to keep him from getting there the storm didn't work and so the very demonic power that had sent him was waiting on the shore when he got there and the moment he stepped out of the boat that very devil that sent the storm fell down and worshipped him because they understood once he got there they were powerless to stop him every devil in your life right now understands that the anointing is here in this place and he is powerless to stop what God is going to do in your life powerless to do that that's why sometimes you get in those places in your life where you feel like you're under such warfare and you feel like you're under such attack understand that the reason that the storm has been sent to many of your lives is because of the prophetic destiny on your life and because that God has ordained you to go over to the other side into areas that have been inhabited by demon power and they don't want to be dislodged maybe it's a job maybe it's something else maybe it's a ministry God's called you to I'm not sure what it is but God has called you to a different area maybe you're breaking strongholds in your familial line but the enemy does not want to let go of those things and God he knows God's anointing is upon you and he'll send the storms but understand the storm cannot sink you when the master is in the boat so Jesus goes over to Gadara sets him free gets back in the boat and goes on back on over to the other side. And when he gets over to the other side, he's met by a man named Jairus. Now Jairus was one of the rulers of the synagogue, a rabbi himself. Jairus had already had heard the reputation. Jesus had been made famous. And so Jairus had come to Jesus he had had a daughter at home who was on her sickbed at the point of death and she he comes to Jesus and begs him to come to his house to lay his hands on her and says if you do that Lord she'll be healed and she will live what are the next couple verses in your Bible it says and Jesus went The first thing that you have to understand concerning the will of God in divine healing is you have to understand that faith cannot exist where the will of God is not known. He had asked if Jesus would come. And the Bible says that Jesus went. 
Jesus did not stop and say, hold on a minute, Jairus. I remember you missed, you've missed three Sabbath services. Hold on a minute, Jairus. Let me pull out your tithing roll. What about the fifth Saturday, the fifth Sabbath? What happened there, Jairus? He didn't ask Jairus, well, have you been a good man? Have you lived righteously? He came to Jesus with the humility and the faith that he would heal his daughter. And Jesus simply didn't even answer him. The Bible says, and Jesus just went. He just went. There are only three questions asked in your Bible concerning the will of God to heal. Only three questions in the New Testament. The first question concerning the will of God to heal comes in Mark chapter 1 from the mouth of a man that is a leper. And he comes to Jesus and he says to him, Lord, if you be willing, thou canst make me whole. What did Jesus say? I will. And I've heard backslidden preachers try to tell me, well, it's not always God's will to heal. You know, sometimes. Get behind me, Satan. It is the will of God to be healed. It is his will. Jesus said the thief cometh but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You can differentiate the workings of the enemy or Jesus based on that. Is it stealing, killing, or destroying? It's not from God. He said, I will. Well, they say, well, you know, God put that on me to teach me something. God put that on, you know, to teach you. He's trying to humble you. Well, you just ain't seem to be learning then, huh? If God put that on you to teach you something, why are you rebelling against God and taking Advil? Because if he put it on you, who are you to go to the walk-in clinic? If he put that thing on you, you might as well stay home and suffer with a smile. Because let me tell you something. If God put it on you, Ajax ain't getting it off. God didn't put that on you to teach you something. He didn't say to that leper, oh, I'm sorry, man, I put this on you to teach you something. He said, I will be clean. If it was the will of God to not heal you, don't you think somewhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you would find someone that came to Jesus for healing and he would say, hold on a minute, I can't heal you because you ain't learned your lesson yet. Because There's a lot of people that seem to not learn lessons. I would surely think there'd be somebody up in the scripture that Jesus would have said that to. Question number one says, Lord, if it be your will, Jesus answers that with two words in red letters. And I don't care what theologian told you differently. I don't care what book told you differently. I don't even care what your track record or circumstance tells you. There are two red letters in your Bible. And if you know nothing else, understand this. He responded with, I will. And then the second question came from a man that had a demon possessed eight, seven or eight year old boy and he had brought that boy to his disciples and his disciples could not cast him out Jesus took his inner circle on up on the mount of transfiguration and he comes back down off that mountain the Bible says there's some kind of a drama had broken out at the bottom of the mountain. He gets down there and he says, what is the big to do? That's what he said. What's going on down here? 
He heard the arguing and the fighting and the commotion. He gets down and he says, I go on up here with just two guys. I come down here and the rest of you boys down here couldn't even handle business while I was gone. What's going on? And he gets down there and here's this distraught man screaming and hollering at these disciples. And he said, I brought these, I brought these men, my boy. He's demon possessed. The spirit would come upon him and throw him into the fire. He would foam at the mouth and convulse and try to throw himself in the fire to harm himself. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not cast it out. He said to Jesus, Lord, if you can do anything, surely you can heal my boy. And Jesus responds to him in a paraphrase. It's not a question of what I can or can't do, but a question of rather what only you can believe because Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So in other words, the answer to that question is, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. He said, bring the boy to me. He brings the boy to him, and Jesus, with a word, delivered him. With one word. I was in Mexico. They had a young boy crawling around, barking like a dog trying to kill himself. I was preaching in the middle of what the Zeta cartel had considered their territory till I got there. Because when I put my feet there, it don't belong to me and it don't belong to them. It belongs to Yahweh. They brought this boy to the service. He was catatonic and they sat him down in the middle of the chair in the front of the service and I made him wait till I was done preaching. I walked up to that boy. I didn't have to hand him a paper sack. I didn't have to roll him around and pat him on the back. I looked at him and said, you foul devil in the name of Jesus, come out of him. And he was set free. If you can believe all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. That was question number two. And then question number three concerning the will of God to heal came not from man to God, but from God to man. This is probably the most important question concerning the will of God to heal that there is in the entirety of the Bible. John chapter number five. Jesus finds a man paralyzed laying there by birth at the pool of Bethesda. He walks up to the man who had been lying there for oft times the angel of the Lord would come down and stir the waters and he that would step in first would be healed of whatever affliction they had had and people had gathered there under Solomon's porch they would sit there and they would wait for the water to stir for just the right moment and then the first person to get in that water but your Bible says this was a man that had been there his entire life How many people you think he saw get their miracle before him? He laid there and watched everybody else always seem to make it in the water before they. On the outside looking in, everybody else always got their touch. Everybody else always got their thing. Everybody else always got their miracle. And here he is. He lays there at the edge of the water. Jesus walks up to him and Jesus standing there the man not even realizing that the very man that stirred the waters was standing behind him himself and he said to the man hey do you want to be well he asked him do you want to be healed because some people don't actually want it. Some people rather keep getting that check every month. Some people really rather learn to live with affliction because that means they have to go back to work. I've had people come to me, would you pray that I get my disability check? How about I pray you get healed? What's wrong with you? How 
but I pray you get healed. I'm talking about healthy people. There ain't nothing wrong with them except for a couple little aches and pains. They're trying to figure out how to scheme the government. They asked this man, he said, do you want to be healed? And the man doesn't even respond with yes or no. He responds with, I have no man to help me. That's your problem right there. Always looking for a system or for a man other than God to do it for you. He said, I have no man to help me in the water when it gets stirred. I don't know about you, but if I was laying by that water for 30 some years like this man was, I'd have figured out how to get somebody to lower me by the edge. And then after that water starts stirring, I'd just roll myself right into that water. If you want it bad enough, desperation make you do all kind of crazy stuff. I mean, desperation will make a mother steal formula for her babies. Desperation will make you do some things you would have never done before. Desperation made David eat the bread out of the temple when it wasn't even according to the law of God. Desperation will make you do some things. They ask him, do you want to be well? Jesus asked him that. Because he's a merciful God, he said, take up your bed and walk. The thing about that is he did it on the Sabbath. He did it on the Sabbath. He takes up his bed and the man is healed by the power of God. Everybody knows that this is the man that was crippled up for 30 plus years. The man takes up his mat and he walks. And what happens? The religious folk get stirred up. Divine healing has always been opposed by the religious folk. And he did it on the Sabbath. Why did he do it on the Sabbath? Because he wanted to do that on the Sabbath. That man got his miracle on the very day. Nobody thought it was even ever possible. You weren't supposed to do things like that on the Sabbath. But he got his miracle on the Sabbath. I want you to know tonight... You might not even feel like it's possible and you're supposed to get that miracle, but God's going to show up for you right then on the very day in the very place when everybody else says he can't do it, when everybody else says he won't do it, when everybody else says he can't, he's not allowed to do it. God can't work in that mess because you did it to yourself. God will give you your miracle right then and right there. So those are the three questions concerning God's will to heal. So Jairus comes to Jesus. He asks him to heal and Jesus just goes. And on his way to Jairus' house, he is detoured by a woman. Now the Bible speaks of the tenacity and the faith in multiple places of woman. There is, there is something supernatural almost on the determination of a woman when they have set their mind to something you ain't talking them out of it you're not talking them out of it I mean there was a Syrophoenician woman had come to Jesus with a demon possessed daughter and she wasn't even entitled to a miracle she was a heathen a devil worshiper herself But she somewhere had heard of Jesus and got on that donkey or on that wagon or whatever means she used to come and she came down with the desperation to get down there where Jesus was and she begged him for mercy and what did Jesus say? He called her a dog. Think about that. Now I know you self-help preachers won't probably like they'll cover over stuff like that. Well, he didn't really mean it like, yeah, he did. In Middle Eastern culture, to call someone a dog is the lowest form of insult you could give them. Now here in the West, you know, we got pet dogs and we we treat them better than we do people. But pretty much everywhere else in the world, they treat animals like what God intended them to be is actually animals to serve you. 
most of the places that I've been in many of these nations, they wouldn't in their right mind even think of letting a dog in their house. I mean, after all, those things carry disease and carry bacteria, and they got enough problems on their own. Jesus called her a dog. And she was still on. Now I know here in American church in the West, she get offended. Your know, pastor didn't shake my hand. I'm going to the church down the street. He ain't talked to me on three Sundays. He even talked to that same woman after service every time. He don't never. Hey, I don't even think he knows my kids' names. Well, God knows your kids' names. What difference does it make? She wasn't deterred. She had to get her miracle. And she said, Lord, even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. What was she saying? She said, I know. I know it might not seem like I'm, I'm not Jewish. I don't belong to the house of Israel or the seed of David. I'm, I understand you came to first save the house of Israel, but I understand you're he that created the heavens and the earth. And I understand that I might not be Jewish, but I'm acknowledging you as my master and as my Lord. And I might be a dog. I might be a devil worshiper. I might be unclean. And I might be a sinner. But today something's going to change in my life. And I acknowledge you that I... I even I eat from the crumbs that fall from my master's table and just one of those crumbs has enough power to set my house free and he said I've never seen such great faith in all of Israel don't allow offense to roadblock you from your miracle Offense will stifle the miracle working power of God in your life. Be offended. So Jesus gets detoured on the way to Jairus' house. The Bible says that there was a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 long years. This was a woman that the scholars believe had actually had some type of a venereal disease and that this particular disease had caused her to bleed for 12 years and the Bible says she for 12 long years she tried everything she could to stop it she had spent all that she had on every doctor under the sun and on every witch doctor that she could find. Every type of remedy she went to, she, she did everything there was. Somebody say, well, you know you ever have the problem and somebody say, well, you need to try this. Why don't you put some vinegar on it and do all these little wives' tales and all these old time things. You know, I'm putting onions in my socks and all this. She did everything. I grew up, you know, daddy put Vicks on you. Vicks cured everything back in those days. Boy, I, oh, I'm telling you right now, they had COVID back then. Vicks would have cured it. My dad wouldn't have put no mask on me. He'd have went up there and got the Vicks and rubbed it in my chest and stuck my T-shirt over top of it and made me go to sleep in it. <laughs> Wake up healed. Anointing in Ville. We all anoint you with Vicks. She did everything. Some of y'all, listen, 12 long years she had this thing. Now this was a woman that did, had done it to herself. She had this 12, she had this issue of blood for 12 young, long years and part of it was probably her own fault. I mean, it does take two. Don't tell me you fell into sin. You didn't fall into it, you planned it. Because if you didn't plan it, it probably wasn't sin. So I say, well, I, I fell into that relationship. No, you didn't. You didn't fall into that relationship. You planned it. Because you could have said no a million times. But you kept on having conversation, doing things you shouldn't have did over and over and over again. Don't tell me you fell into it. You didn't fall into it. You planned it. She did whatever it was that she, she was part of the problem. But you understand that God is a merciful God and it does not matter 
obviously whether or not you've caused it. He's a God that's merciful and gracious to forgive. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases and His mercy is new every morning. But for 12 long years she was afflicted. And under Jewish custom and culture and by the law of Moses itself, she was not permitted to be outside of the home. When a woman was menstruating, she had to be in the home during that time. She couldn't touch another man. She couldn't touch another individual. She was considered unclean, had to stay in there. But the Bible says that there was a woman. She had heard of Jesus and she had made the determination in herself. She understood that she had tried everything there was to try and never grew better, but rather grew worse. She was desperate. I have to ask you, are you tired yet? Because some try everything else there is to try before they ever think of God. God is a forethought. Now, I appreciate modern medical science. I appreciate the wisdom. All healing comes from God. If you're healed at the hand of a doctor or if you're healed through the power of God and divine healing, whether it is God that commands your body to heal, whether or not you were on a surgery table or whether or not you had hands laid upon you, it is God that commands you to heal. Were it not for the grace of God, that doctor wouldn't have the wisdom that he had. Were it not for the grace of God, he would have messed up at that operation. Were it not for the grace of God, your body would not have responded and healed itself the way God God intended your body to heal. All healing comes from God. But sometimes folk try everything else except God. He is the last of their thought. And this woman had tried everything there was until something different had happened. The Bible said... That after she had tried everything there was to try and after she had got tired, sometimes you have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Sometimes you have to be tired of being pushed down, held back for far too long. Sometimes you, like Rosa Parks, need to be tired of being told to go to the back of the bus and you're going to get exactly what God has entitled you to get. Sometimes you're just not tired enough. Sometimes you've not had enough, but this woman had had enough. She was tired enough. Twelve years was enough. She wasn't going to live like this any longer because finally she had heard of Jesus. Faith began to come alive on the inside of her heart when she had heard about Jesus. Jairus had obviously heard about Jesus. This woman had heard about Jesus. And as even the Syrophoenician woman had heard about Jesus, something came alive on the inside of the Syrophoenician woman to know about Jesus. And faith, enough faith had come alive on the inside of her heart to make that travel down from Sidon, to come down and find the Lord. Jairus had had enough faith on the inside of him that he no longer cared if the Pharisees or Sadducees from the temple saw him. He had to get to the one who had the power to heal his daughter this woman with the issue of blood for 12 long years had heard about Jesus and the Bible does not tell us what she had heard about Jesus it just simply says she had heard about Jesus perhaps she had heard that in Genesis he was the seed of the woman perhaps she had heard that in Exodus he was the Passover lamb perhaps she had heard that in Leviticus he was her great high priest perhaps she had heard that in Numbers he was the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night I don't know what she heard but maybe she heard in Deuteronomy that he was a prophet like unto Moses maybe she heard in Joshua that he was the captain of the Lord's salvation maybe she heard that in Judges he was our lawgiver maybe she heard that in Ruth he was our kinsman redeemer maybe she heard in 1st and 2nd Samuel that he was our trusted prophet maybe she heard in 1st and 2nd Kings he was the seed of David the king upon the throne of Israel maybe she heard in 1st and 2nd Chronicles that he was the temple of Solomon. Maybe she heard in Ezra that he was the faithful scribe. Maybe she heard in Nehemiah that he was the rebuilder of the broken down walls. I don't know what she heard but maybe she heard Job say my redeemer liveth and though he slay me yet shall I serve him. 
Maybe she heard in Psalms that the Lord was her shepherd and she would not want. Maybe she heard in Proverbs and Ecclesiastics that he was her wisdom. Maybe she heard in the Song of Solomon that he was her bridegroom and the lover of her soul because she had been mistreated by man after man and she understood that he was the only one that would love her like the way she needed to be loved. Maybe she heard that Isaiah said he was the Prince of Peace and the Mighty God. He was the Lord high on his throne. Maybe she heard in Jeremiah who he said he was the righteous branch and the Lord for whom nothing is too hard. Maybe she heard in Lamentations that he was the weeping prophet. Maybe she heard in Ezekiel that he was the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Maybe she heard in Daniel that he was the fourth man walking around in the fire. Maybe she heard Daniel say he was the son of man coming in the clouds of glory. Maybe she heard in Hosea that he was the husband forever married to the adulterous wife. Maybe she heard Joel say he was the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Maybe she heard Amos say he was our burden bearer. Maybe she heard the prophet Obadiah cry out and say God and mighty to save. Maybe she heard Jonah say he was our great foreign missionary. Maybe she heard Micah to declare that he would come from Bethlehem and he would be the messenger with beautiful feet. Maybe she heard Nahum say that he was the avenger of God's elect. Maybe she heard Habakkuk say he was God's evangelist that cried out revive thy works O Lord in the midst of the year maybe she heard Zephaniah say he was the savior maybe she heard Haggai say he was the glory of the latter house that would be greater than the former maybe she heard Zephaniah say maybe she heard Zechariah say he was a fountain opened up for uncleanness and the very sins she had committed maybe she heard Malachi say that the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his wings. I don't know what she heard about Jesus, but whatever it was, faith had become alive on the inside of her heart. Maybe she heard Isaiah say he was wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities and the chastisement that brought me peace was laid upon him and with his stripes I'm healed. Maybe she heard Isaiah 53 also say surely he was bruised. Surely. Surely. You can't shout anywhere in there. Shout at that word surely. Surely he hath carried my sicknesses and bore my sorrows. Surely. That means without a doubt. That means you can go up into your bedroom when your child has a 105 degree fever. That means you can go in there when the doctor has him in ICU. That means you can go in there when nobody else knows what to do and you don't know anything else. Just open up Isaiah 5, chapter 53 and repeat that word surely. Without a doubt. Without exception. Surely he carried my fever. Surely he carried COVID. Surely he carried pneumonia. Surely he carried cancer. Surely he carried heart defect. Surely he carried diabetic condition surely he carried heroin overdose surely he carried it upon himself I don't know what she heard but whatever she heard faith came alive on the inside of her because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God she had been in that house cooped up and had heard somebody perhaps had come knocking on that door and said, I, I heard a man, he just healed a blind boy. He just healed a deaf man. He just cast seven devils out of that married woman named Mary. He just set that gathering free on the other side of the lake. He had 2,000 demons. I know if he can do it for him, he can do it for you. I don't know what she heard, but whatever she heard, faith came alive. And then she said, She heard about Jesus and the Bible says and then she said if I can but touch the hem of his garment because faith doesn't say he's able faith says he will the devil knows he's able I know unsafe folks that know he's able but faith says he will she heard and then she said within herself if I can but just touch the hem of his garment I shall not I might 
Not maybe, it might work. Let's just try it and see what happens. No, she said, I shall be made whole. She ain't even lived in the market. 11, 22, 23, and 24 yet when Jesus stood and said, Verily I say unto you, you, if you have faith and you believe in your heart and not doubt, you will say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and not doubt in your heart, you would have whatsoever what you saith. Well, I don't believe in all that stuff. I don't believe in that name and claim it, that stuff. Well, you just don't believe the Bible then. Because my Bible says, if you believe in your heart, you would have whatever you say. Yeah, there's no dust on there. That's not a trick Bible. It's there. She said, because it's not enough. With the heart, man believeth. But with the mouth, can, don't tell me you're saved and you can't tell nobody. You're not saved. You're, not, you're just as on your way to hell as before. you just deceived now. Big difference. With the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confession is made. You, how you believe in your heart, but faith without works is dead. Faith requires you to do something. And she had faith on the inside of her that came alive because of what she heard. And when she heard about Jesus, now faith sprung alive on the inside of her spirit man. And now she said, if I can just touch the hem of his, I don't even need to get a hold of his skin. All I need to do is touch the fringes of his tit. All I need to do is touch the knots in the bottom of his garment because I understand that they're intertwined and woven. And the very name of Yahweh himself is in that garment. And I understand that, yeah, he's the seed of the woman and he is mighty God. All I need to do is grab a hold of his name and I shall be healed. She heard and then she said. She heard and then she said. And then she went. You have to hear. You have to say. And you have to do something. I've prayed for many people. And sometimes they expect that instantaneous thing and many times they get it that way. But other times, it's not until they actually get up out of that chair. The first person I'd ever prayed for that walked out of a wheelchair. I was a Bible college student. I came home like on a summer break or something like that. I was wet behind the ears, didn't know a whole lot of anything. Except I believed what I read. I was preaching in this park and there probably wasn't even 12 people there listening to me preach. Somebody had invited me to come and preach at this youth thing. So I came and preached like my hair was on fire, which I still do. I'm just losing some of that. And they wheeled that boy up. He was probably, I think he was 12 years old. His name was Chad actually. They wheeled him up and sat him in that wheelchair and I walked over to him and I laid my hands on him and I said silver and gold have I none but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus rise up and walk and I said I'm going to pull you out of that wheelchair that's what I thought in my mind I said rise up and walk and I grabbed that boy to pull him up this 12 year old boy to pull him up out of that wheelchair and every devil in hell was screaming in my ear don't you dare pull that boy up out of that wheelchair don't you dare pull him out of that wheelchair he's going to fall down you're going to look like a fool and his family's going to be upset with you they're going to run you out of this park and I said no devil I'm not listening to you I didn't listen to him I didn't know any better as young as I was I grabbed that boy unhooked him out of that wheelchair and I grabbed him by his right arm lifted him up out of that wheelchair and that 12 year old boy with leg braces from his knees down to his ankle walked across Cross that platform healed by the power of God then we took the braces off and held the braces up in the air and that boy was so touched by the power of God his parents later wrote back and said when they got him home he wouldn't stop walking up and down the hallway he was so excited let me tell you something God still empties wheelchairs My mentor laughed. We talk about Jack Coe. He'd laugh and say, oh, Brother Coe, he'd say he'd yank you out of that wheelchair whether you were healed or not. <laughs> he did. 
He prayed for you in a wheelchair. He pulled you out of that wheelchair and you either walked or you fell on the floor. And if you fell on the floor, he'd just step over you and pray for the next guy. He said, but more of them walked than didn't. Sometimes it takes the reckless faith of somebody like that's going to believe God and they don't care. Understand this. Todd White said this. He prayed for about a thousand people before he even started seeing the first few people get healed. You had to understand this. Understand this, that you're worried about your reputation and you're worried about your, your dignity. Understand this, that your self-esteem is not a fruit of the Spirit. Self-esteem is not a fruit of the Spirit. Your dignity is not a fruit of the Spirit. What you look like, ridicule upon yourself, is not a fruit of the Spirit. Stop worrying about what you're going to look like and start worrying about what He'll look like when they actually walk. And when you care more about what He'll look like and you don't care that you'll look like a fool, God will allow His miracle-working power to flow through your hands. Faith without works is dead. So she heard, and then she said, and then she went. And she went. She had heard Jesus had now gotten to town, and she had took the risk. Risk is often attributed to faith because faith is going to require you to do something. She went out of the house into the press where she was not allowed to go. She disobeyed the quarantine order. <laughs> I've had people be like, well, my back's hurt and I couldn't make it to the meeting. Well, you should have came and got healed. <laughs> but keep popping your Percocets because that's what you really want anyway. You afraid to get healed because God take you they'll take you off those painkillers. Right. I can set you free with my left hand from that addiction. <clears throat> so she heard, then she said, then she went. She said, I don't care who sees me. I don't care if the chief priests see me. I don't care who sees me, who tries to grab me. I've got to get to Jesus. And she wedged her way in the midst of the crowd to get to him. And she, she slid up between she slid up between the press. Jesus was being thronged by people on all sides. So much so that when she finally touched him, he said he felt virtue go out of his body. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples thought he'd lost his mind for a minute. And they said, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's been touching you. Everybody's grabbing you. Everybody's high-fiving you, Jesus. You're a celebrity. Everybody is wanting to put their arm around you. Everybody's rubbing elbows and shoulders. They're, 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 they're celebrating him in the streets. They've come out to touch him, to put their arms around him. Here is Jesus has come to my town. Come to my house, Jesus. No, come to my house, Jesus. No, come over here, Jesus. And they've all got their arms around him, and they're trying to touch him. Everybody's been touching him. Everybody's around him. Everybody's pulling on him. But one person touched him differently, and virtue came out of his body, and he said who touched me and they said Lord how can you say who touched me don't you see all these other people touching you he said no somebody touched me differently Amen. somebody touched him with faith and virtue came out of his body power faith activates the anointing faith was a conductor wire that let the power of God course into her body. Everybody else was touching her. You can take a battery terminal. But until you put both cables on that battery, ain't nothing going to happen. But the minute you put both of them on there, power has come alive. Faith is those terminals that allow the charge, the power of God to flow into your situation. Faith are the antennas. I remember we were kids, we had you know television with the turn dial. We had VHF and UHF. And about only one channel came in clear. And really not that clear, just clear enough to be able to see what the fuzz had on it. 
and you have to turn the antennas and then them things that break off and we'd stick a coat hanger in the middle of it. <laughs> Y'all young folk don't know nothing about that. And then maybe you had one of them antennas went upside of the house and tried to climb up there. We used to play hide and seek and climb up that thing. Now you get off that antenna. That's where our boys get that stuff from. <laughs> but you'd have to get out there and you had to move that antenna. Why? Because it, it had to hit the signal. And when you had it at the right degree, when you had it at the right position, You'd hear them yelling on the inside out, Hold it right there Hold it right there I got the picture Hold it right there You need to get your faith right there You need to get your faith right there When you get your faith in the right spot And you mix it with the word See understand that the word did not pro- Hebrew says that speaking of the people of God In the wilderness The word profited them little The word is not enough. The word is just the entry point. The word profited them little not being mixed with faith in them that hurt it. The word will do you no good until you apply faith to the word. She could have heard of Jesus, but it would have done her no good until she had decided to say and then go. You can sit at home and hear about everybody else's miracle. But if you don't put that antenna in the right spot for yourself. And when she did, virtue came out of his body. And he said, who touched my clothes? And there was a transfer of the anointing of God, the power of God. faith came alive on the inside of her heart and after 12 years of being tired and after 12 years she had spent the Bible says all that she had she spent all she had every last dime But then she heard about Jesus. And she said, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment. Because she understood what Malachi said, that the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his wings. Those wings are not actually birds' wings like you may think. He's actually speaking in the Hebrew, talking about the wings of the tallit, or the, the tistit that would ha- The tallit actually didn't exist till later. The tistit would hang underneath their garments in those days. The, the, the two lower extremities and the, the tistis fringes that would hang down they were considered to be the wings the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his wings and all she needed to do was to grab a hold of his garment and power coursed into her body and everything that was unclean with her and one moment was made clean here was a woman that was considered unclean here was a woman that was supposed to be quarantined from everybody else but the moment her uncleanness touched his cleanness his cleanness had the power to drive out what was unclean in her life And I don't care how unclean you may feel. I don't care how dirty your life may have been or may even be right now. I don't care how far you've been, how long you've stayed. Yes, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, make you stay longer than you wanted to stay. In the end, you'll always pay more than you wanted to pay. But if you'll finally ever get to the place where you'll realize that you finally spent it all and you've come to Him, what is clean in Him, what is holy in Him, will drive out all of the unholiness and all of the uncleanness in your life I don't know about you but there is enough power in the name and the word of God to fix anything that's wrong in your life how many believe that tonight come on and stand with me
I believe faith has come alive on the inside of many of your hearts tonight to believe and to receive from God. The first thing I'm going to pray for tonight. If you're in this place and you need healing in your body. The same Lord that healed the woman with the issue of blood. That delivered the Syrophoenician woman. Same Lord that healed Jairus' daughter. When Jesus finally showed up. He got sidetracked with the woman with the issue of blood. By the time he gets done with her. Jairus is standing right there. He's going with Jairus to his house. And on his way to Jairus' house, here comes this woman. And there's always a woman, right? Detours him. Detours him. He gets hemmed up for a few minutes there. Jairus says, all right, come on. This way. This is the way to my house. He gets to Jairus' house. And there's a commotion. They're crying and they're wailing. And they come out to Jairus. You read the rest of the chapter. They come out to Jairus. And they say, Jairus, she's dead. You waited too long, Jairus. You should have brought Jesus sooner. She's dead. Your little girl, Jairus, is dead. They said to Jairus, why trouble the master? She's dead already. In other words, they told him, let Jesus go home. It's your time to mourn, Jairus. Jairus said, no. No. And they take him into the, into the inner room and they, they laugh. They laughed at him. They laughed at Jesus and Jairus. This is too impossible, God. Just let us go. Let us mourn. I can't believe no more. I'm going to let it go now. I can live like this. He put the unbelief out of the room and he said, Little girl, Talitha Kumai, which in the Aramaic is rise. She sat up and walked out of that room. And everybody that laughed at him, everybody that scorned Jairus, watch this eight little eight year old little girl bounce down the stairway and through the living room. I don't care who told you she was dead. I don't care who told you he's been detoured too long healing everybody else. You felt like the man at the pool of Bethesda. Everybody else always got theirs first. But tonight, faith has come alive in your heart. And I believe you will get your miracle tonight. So if you need healing in your body for whatever it is, and you believe in your heart, And you say, I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come to this altar. Because there's enough power in the transferring of the power of God. There was enough anointing in Elisha's bones. There was enough anointing in the garment of Jesus. There was enough anointing in Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons. The healing power of God is in this house. Because He is the God that healeth you. He is the Lord that heals all of your diseases. He is the Lord that sent His Word and healed you and delivered you from all destruction. And if you believe it, I want you to come and lift up your hands. He's in this place tonight. His tangible anointing is in this house tonight. I can feel it in my hand. It's in this place tonight. It's in this place tonight. It's in this place tonight. I don't... Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. In the name of Jesus. In a few minutes, I'm going to lay my hands on you. And when I do, whatever it is, whatever you're believing for, you need to receive it in the name of Jesus. I believe right now tumors are going to dissolve and pass out of your bodies. I believe that heart valves are going to open up. Pain is going to leave someone's right hip tonight. I believe that in the name of Jesus, arthritic conditions are coming out of your body. I believe in the name of Jesus, nerves are being healed in your eyes. In the name of Jesus, ears are being healed. In the name of Jesus, right now tonight, right now tonight, kidneys are being healed. Diabetes is being 
being cured tonight by the power of Jesus Christ. Tonight, 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 right now, addictions are being driven out. Pornography addictions, lust spirits are being driven out in the name of dependencies on painkillers and antidepressants are leaving your body tonight. Tonight, you've spent it all. You've done everything you could think of, but tonight, tonight, there is one. There is one that sticketh closer than any brother. There is one who is the righteous branch. There is one who is the son of righteousness who has arisen with healing in his wings and his name is Jesus and tonight by his power and his power alone and through his authority of his name I lay my hands upon you and command every pain to leave your body command sickness to go from you in the name of Jesus I take authority over spirits of cancer I take authority over spirits of neurological disorders I take authority over bipolar condition I take authority over anxiety and suicidal spirits I command them now leave in Jesus name come out of your body in the name of Jesus be healed now I release the anointing of God right now into every broadcast wave in the name of Jesus those that are watching on Facebook and live stream and YouTube right now be healed in the name of Jesus I command your 11 year old daughter be healed by the power of God in the name of Jesus I release the anointing of God even into pastor's eye right now in the name of Jesus Christ be made whole there he is right now there it is right now receive it in the name of Jesus right now the anointing of God be healed be healed in the name of Jesus be healed and be made whole right now be made whole in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus receive it now in the name of Jesus be healed be healed in Jesus name in the name of Jesus receive right now in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus. In the name go in the name of Jesus be healed right now in every area of your body in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus right now be healed be healed in the name of Jesus right now right now his miracle working power in the name of Jesus be healed every area every area of your body in the name of Jesus right now the anointing of God the anointing of God the anointing the anointing the anointing the anointing, the anointing right now the anointing of God the anointing of God right now the anointing of God right now right now right now in the name of Jesus Christ be loose from this affliction in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name do it do it Lord right now right lift up your hands in the name of Jesus Christ touch your God right now your anointing touch your Lord in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name right now right now receive in the name of Jesus 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 